your song books at number 859. Number 859 will be the song of encouragement this morning after Brother John's lesson. <clears throat> and if you would, please turn with me to number 971. Number 971. <clears throat> Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. That's my advice to you. When the screen's showing, take notes quick and, and we'll make it through this. You might have to do it the old-fashioned way and listen to me. Old-fashioned preaching. I want us this morning to think for just a moment about the Thanksgiving and reverence because we've just celebrated Thanksgiving, haven't we? And we do that well. We enjoy Thanksgiving. We enjoy being thankful. We enjoy giving thanks. We do that very well. This morning, I want us to think about those two topics, thanksgiving and reverence, in respect to worship. I want to start out this morning as a means of introduction. Listen to these scriptures. Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 46. For long ago in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. Listen to Psalms 50, verse 14. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. Psalm 69 verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify Him with thanksgiving. And I love Psalm 100 verses 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness to all generations. Those are just a few scriptures that really pinpoint thanksgiving and reverence when it comes to our worship service. Ladies and gentlemen, there's something that we need to be careful of in today's age, and that is the reverence side of worship. Now think back with me for just a moment. We're still introducing the lesson this morning. I was born in 1972. Some of you will remember 1972. Some of you will not remember 1972. So think about 1972 with me. Gas cost 36 cents a gallon. A gallon of milk in 1972 cost $1.20. A loaf of bread cost 24 cents. A postage stamp cost 10 cents. A house cost $30,000 in 1972. And a Ford car would cost under $4,000 in 1972. Now, fast forward to today. 2020. The average cost of gasoline this year was $2.58. Now, 
The average cost of a gallon of milk costs $3.50. A loaf of bread is $2.50. A postage stamp, I never thought I'd see it go over 50 cents, but they are 55 cents for a postage stamp now. And a house, the median cost of a house is $321,000. By the way, if you're thinking along the lines of math, that's a 1,000% increase right on the money from 1972 to today. $321,000. The average cost of a car today is $37,851. Wow. Have times changed? They most certainly have. And ladies and gentlemen, when you think about the church, have times changed? I'm going to throw out another name. My dad loved Flip Wilson. Now, I'm, I, that's before my time even. But my dad, we'd watch reruns of Flip Wilson, the Flip Wilson show. How many of you remember Flip Wilson? I'm just curious about my audience this morning. Okay, some of you are gray-headed. The others of you are going, we don't have a clue who that is. Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson came up with the line, the devil made me do it. That was his coin phrase, the devil made me do it. But there was also a skit that he did. He, his character, if you remember, was the Reverend Leroy. The Reverend Leroy. And what he did, he ministered to the church of what's happening now. That was the name of that church. It was funny because he took any type of topic that was going on in the world, in the news, and that's what that church was all about that week, that he was the Reverend Leroy. Are we that bad in the Lord's church? Do we just take whatever's going on, whatever comes at us, the latest fad, the latest fashion, and that's what it has to be this day and time? Because, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing, nothing funny about when it comes to worship in the Lord's church today. What happened to reverence? That's my question this morning. What happened to the reverence we're to have in the Lord's church when we come to worship Him? I want us to look at three areas this morning as we look, think about this topic. First of all, let's think about reverence in worship in Moses' day. Take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 19. We're going to be bouncing around Exodus quite a bit in this first title here, this first point. Exodus chapter 19. The book of Exodus has really two major themes. There's a theme of liberation, chapters 1 through 8. And then you have the theme of covenant, chapters 19 through 40. Now there are several steps in between when the nation of Israel gets this covenant in chapters 19 through 40. First of all, you notice the location that the covenant was given. We all know that, don't we? The covenant was given at Mount Sinai. The nation of Israel is gathered around the base of Mount Sinai. And by the way, God comes to Moses and gives the children of Israel, here's what you will tell these people to do in preparation just to stand at the base of this mountain. It's a whole list of things they have to do. Moses goes up to the mountain. He receives the Ten Commandments. And we'll talk about those more in just a moment. And we notice the purpose of this covenant is because these people are a special treasure to God Verse 5 of that chapter 19. They're to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Verse 6 of chapter 19. And they are going to agree to accept the terms of this covenant. To keep the commandments of God. The Lord then orders Moses to sanctify the people in order to worship him. Now first of all, there's going to be a cleansing by water, Exodus chapter 19, verse 10. Then there are going to be clear boundaries, verse 12, that will be given to this nation. Now stop right there just a moment. We live in a day and time in a nation that we really struggle with clear boundaries. Used to be an old phrase when I was a young person. The Bible says it. I believe it. That says We don't think that way anymore. God will give this nation boundaries. Thou shalt. Thou shalt not. Black and white. When you come into the New Testament today and we look at God's words through the Holy Spirit into these men that wrote it, we have the same exact wording. This is what you do. This is what you do not do. It is the same boundaries. Why in the world? 
world do we not look at that and do what he tells us to do instead of adding to and taking away from? Because of the time we live in, remember. We'll think about more of that in just a minute. There are clear boundaries. Now put yourself at the base of this mountain. These are going to be given to Moses. The people are surrounded this mountain. There's thick smoke. There is lightning. There's thunder. And these people are struck with fear. And the terms of this covenant... They're revealed in Exodus 20 through chapter 23. And if, if these people are going to live with holy God, then this nation has to be holy also. And these commandments, first they're stated in the Ten Commandments that Moses will bring down off the mountain. And then he will go on and give more examples, a little more in depth. But when this happens, at this mountain, the people are terrified they are fearful and they are standing afar off begging Moses you speak to God we don't want to go in front of him because he will kill us you speak to him through Moses God will give what this nation has to do You'll notice by Exodus chapter 24, the next step in that covenant is the ratification by blood. Exodus 24 verses 1 through 8. There will be a seal, God's part and the nation of Israel's part, both being sealed. And the blood will symbolize this seal on both parts, both parties. And they will symbolize their oath. But notice something else. Look at Exodus 24 verse 7. The people respond, they agree to obey all the commandments of God. And there's going to be the glory of God is going to be revealed to the elders of the people, Aaron and yes, Nadab and Abihu, Nadab and Abihu that we read about, we know what they did, and 70 elders. Listen to verses 9 through 11, Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11. Then Moses and Aaron Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, notice this is all we read about. Under his feet, as it were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very uh, heaven of clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The very description of Jehovah is the pavement that he walks on. That is the God that is in our presence this morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have come before him in this worship service. And these men, when they look up, all they see is the pavement, the gravel that his feet are going to walk on. That is how great and holy and mighty Jehovah is. Listen here. Isaiah, what he says about him. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called and said to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This was something that was awe-inspiring that these people were reverent and they had a fear. That was in Moses' day. And don't just leave that in the Old Testament. We need to have that godly fear because it's the same God the Father, Jehovah, God Almighty that we're in front of this morning that we have that same reverence for. Now let's shift gears for a moment. What about reverence in worship in Paul's day? It's similar to but yet very different. It's based on a covenant. And the Apostle Paul will contrast these two covenants. Take your Bibles and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Because if Exodus 24 really reveals how reverence and worship ought to be, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 shows a compromise in reverence that can lead to problems in worship. Now you remember from your Bible studies what is going on in the church in Corinth. They are in turmoil. This church is being turned upside down. And there are really three groups of people, two opposing forces, and then one third group of people, two opposing groups. We can letter them the liberals and the legalists. 
Now, if you look at the liberals, they're the ones, they've been living this lewd lifestyle, this very nasty lifestyle. And Paul is like, hey, I know what you're doing. Stop it. That's pretty much in layman's terms. Then you have the legalists. They're the Judaizing teachers. They're coming in and saying, oh, hey, yes, we know we have this new covenant, but you can't forget what Moses gave us. Don't leave this sitting on the back. You better be taking care of this also. And they held these people, they thought in their minds, to this Old Testament covenant. You better be doing that. Now, these two groups opposed each other. The legalists and the liberals, they really despised each other except in their joint opposition to the Apostle Paul and the gospel message. And now all of a sudden, they're united. They're on this forefront coming against Paul. They're going to give him some serious questions throughout 2 Corinthians. And they're going to really question his character. They're going to question his honesty in not coming to Corinth when he said he would. Now, he will explain to them his travel plans. He plans on not coming only once, but twice. So you can be double blessed, he will say. Have a double portion. But that's also the point in Corinthians where he talks about his yes meaning yes and your no meaning no. They will also question his sincerity because of the change of these plans. But he will call upon God as his witness to his sincerity because God has called him to his apostleship. And God would not call someone who could not keep his promises. Then they will accuse of being oppressive. Chapter 1 verses 23 through 24. They're going to say, you're putting upon us something you don't even do. And the apostle Paul will come back and, and reaffirm his intent not to lord over. Not to be this oppressive over their faith. But to work with them in combination to grow their faith. That's what's coming up against him with these two groups in the church at Corinth. There's a third group, though. We're going to label them the loyalists. They're listening to his teachings. They're trying to live out what he is telling them to do. They're the faithful majority. And Paul writes this letter also of encouragement to tell them to keep on keeping on, even when it comes to the worship service where they all will be combined. Now when you think about what he tells them. He tells this group. In chapter 2. He says the ministry of Jesus Christ. The new covenant. Listen to what it is. Paul says it's a covenant. Not of death. But of life. It is a covenant of salvation. Rather than condemnation. It is a covenant of glory. Because it does not fade away. Now if you go back to the book of Exodus. You will notice after a certain time period. Moses wore a veil. He came out with his face being veiled. Lots and lots of discussion on why he wore a veil. One of those discussions is that. He did not want Israel to see the fading glory of that old covenant. What was going to happen to the Old Testament? It was going to come to an end what? When Jesus put on the cross nailed there. And the church was established. That covenant was done away with. It was fading. Here you have this veil. It doesn't have to be over anybody anymore. Because we have a covenant that will never fail. Now stop just a second. Think about 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And the legalists. The Judaizers. They've infiltrated this church. And they're telling these people. Hey, 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 hey. You're doing it all wrong. You can't just take care of what Paul is telling you with this message we call the gospel. You better be doing what Moses told us. And they were trying to bind it on something that had totally disappeared on the day of Pentecost. Unlike Paul. Paul will say this about him in chapter 2 verse 17. He will say they peddle a counterfeit gospel. He will say this about him in chapter 4 verse 2. They are religious racketeers. And Paul's answer in all this. Teach the glorious covenant of Jesus Christ. We call it the gospel. That's his answer.
Then finally, Paul reassures his readers that that veil is not going to be taken away. How? Notice chapter 3, verse 16. By turning to the Lord. We put our faith in Jesus Christ and in his Father. And by hiding nothing from him, verse 18. And by looking intently in his word, verse 18. And we'll see the word mirror used throughout 2 Corinthians. Look at it as a mirror. You want to know something this morning? I didn't know if you know this or not, but did you know that mirrors do not lie? If I want to look really handsome, I don't look in a mirror. If I want to know exactly how I look, I look in a mirror. Right? Isn't that simple? It's so simple when Paul says... Look into the Word. It's your mirror. How do you look? What do you look like? Do we see that? It takes a knowledge of God's Word to see ourselves in that spiritual mirror. He goes on. I love what James writes about this thought of a mirror. And bring that into our worship service. Look at James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. But be doers of the word. And by the way, that also is in our worship service. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. We look in that mirror. And we're letting the Spirit of God transform us into the very image of Jesus Christ. And that is the result of growth, of change. Do we look in that mirror? You see, and that also corresponds to our reverence in worship today. Are we growing in that worship? One last thought I want us to think about this morning. What does reverence look like then in the church today? Five short points I want to share with you from this. First of all, it needs to be characterized by a godly fear. This is very evident in the days of Moses. That thick smoke, lightning, thunder, and then the word. You could hear God's voice trembling down that, that mountain. Do you think those people had a godly fear? We are standing in front of that same God this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Do we have that godly respect for Him just as much today? It frightens me to think that we would not We must. Because if you don't have it today, you will have it on Judgment Day. Guaranteed. But number two, it must include a sacrifice. In Exodus, God makes it plain to Moses that Israel cannot approach him apart from the sacrifice or the shedding of blood. That's what it takes. Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. His blood has been shed, making it possible we don't have to have a veiled face. Making it possible that the Curtain has been torn. We don't have to go into the Holy of Holies. We get to go into heaven itself. That sacrifice has been made with us. What have we done for him? Can we sacrifice just one hour a week? Just one hour? There's so much that we can be doing for him. Number three, holiness. That was part of the reverence and worship that God deserved in the days of Israel. And if you look at Exodus chapters 20 through 23, he demands Israel to be holy in its nature as well. We will not see God in worship or in life or in heaven 
if we are not holy. Fourth word I want us to think about is thanksgiving. Don't leave that out. We need to be thankful that we do get to come before God. Everything he's done for us, everything he's given us, and everything he will continue to give us and do for us throughout our worship and throughout our lives. That thanksgiving part of this. I think it's interesting in Exodus 24 verses 9 through 11, Moses and those that were with him rejoiced at experiencing just a glimpse of God's presence. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then fifth, we need to have an obedient faith. A faith that makes our worship acceptable to God. Before people could worship God at Horeb, they needed to be sanctified with water. They need to be set apart. Now let me ask you a question this morning. Do you think Israel had a faith in God when they were at the foot of that mountain? Well, I guarantee you they did. They believed. They believed wholeheartedly in God at that moment. We need to have that same kind of faith when it comes to God and worshiping Him and living for Him. In 1996, in Nashville, Tennessee, there were more than 4,000 baseball coaches that were gathered. They were there at the Opryland Hotel for the 52nd annual. It was a baseball commission association for that meeting. They had tried to figure out who their speaker was going to be, but one name kept coming up over and over. Finally, they invited this man. John Scolinos was his name. In 1996, he was 78 years old. He had been retired for five years from coaching baseball at the college level. His coaching career had started in 1948. He died in 2009 at the age of 91. The day that he spoke to this group, he shuffled up to the stage, and around his neck hung a home plate. A home plate. He asked that group of coaches, he said, how wide is home plate for all your kids to play on the peewee leagues? It took them a minute, and some guy in the back hollered 17 inches. He said, yes, 17 inches. How wide is home plate for the kids that play in high school? 17 inches. How wide is the plate for the kids that play in the college level? 17 inches. He said, how wide is the plate for the kids that play, the guys that play at the major leagues and minor leagues? 17 inches. He looked at that audience and he went, 17 inches. Now, coaches, if you've got a major league pitcher and he cannot throw that ball over a 17-inch plate, what do you do? Do you make the plate 18 inches wide? 20 inches wide? Or do you send him back to the minors? He said, we know that whenever somebody cannot throw the ball over that plate, we send that guy back to the minors. We don't widen the plate. He said, so why is it, coaches, if we have a player who is late to practice or is getting drunk, were his words, do we widen the plate? He took that plate, and you'll notice, let me change here very quickly. You'll notice that home plate he took, this was his drawing. He turned that plate around, drew on it with the Sharpie, and turned it back around. There was a, a house with these windows and doors. And he said, this is the problem with our home today. I'm quoting. We do not teach accountability to our kids, and there are no consequences for failing to meet standards. We just widen the plate. Then to the top of this little home plate, he added an American flag. This is the problem with our country today. We're compromising the Constitution and not holding people accountable for it. We're allowing others to widen home plate. Then he took and he added a cross to the top of this picture. He said this is the problem in the church today. We're not holding people accountable to God. We're widening home plate. He concluded. 
If we fail to hold ourselves to a higher standard, a standard of what we know to be right, if we fail to hold our spouses and our children to the same standards, if we're unwilling or unable to provide a consequence when they do not meet the standard, and if our schools, government, and churches fail to hold themselves accountable to those they serve, there's but one thing to look forward to. And he stopped. He turned that plate around on the back side, and it was totally black. His words were, dark days lie ahead. Church, are we widening the plate? When it comes to our worship, are we widening the plate? God says do it this way. Sometimes you come in, you look very tired. I understand. Don't widen the plate. Hang in there. When it comes to life, don't widen the plate for them. When it comes to the church, don't widen the plate. When it comes to the reverence and respect we have for God, don't widen the plate. Let me explain very quickly. We like to widen the plate because... Oh, my kid can never do anything wrong. We like to widen the plate. Oh, you mean my child has to do? We widen the plate. Church, adults, what do we do? I know God tells me to do this, and I know God wants me, but you know, we widen the plate. There are, there's thanksgiving, and there is reverence. When it comes to God, I told you once, we are excellent at thanksgiving. But sometimes we struggle with the reverence, the respect. Paul said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all. morning. We want to sing a song here in just a moment. And as always, look inside your heart. Are you wide in the plate? I hope not. But if you have, get back where you need to be. We want to pray for you. This morning, maybe you're not a child of God, let's make that happen. Through the waters of baptism, coming into contact with the power of Jesus' blood, washing your sins away, and having a hope for heaven. Whatever your need may be, would you come together and stand as we sing? He paid a day, he did not
You about had help this morning? I saw that. <laughs> no, that was great. Good to see Gabe. I appreciate that. He's going to be